Hi, my name is Father Robert McTague. I'm a Roman Catholic priest and a Jesuit, a member of the Society of Jesus. And I'm here to make a bold statement to you today, namely, the word cannot be canceled. Now, I can give you all sorts of reasons and demonstrations and proofs. I've spent a lot of time as an academic. I can do those sorts of things. Uh, I can tell you about the power of the word because I'm a reader, a writer, a preacher, a broadcaster. But for now, at least, I want to begin with a story. I want to tell you about Catherine Caulfield. Catherine Caulfield was my father's grandmother, my great-grandmother from Ireland. And she left Ireland, a poor young girl, in the second half of the 19th century. And she went all the way to America, a trip that turned her world inside out and upside down, a trip that she knew she'd never be able to go back on. What happened? She remembered and she remembered and she remembered. She remembered her homeland, she remembered her home, and she knew in her heart that she wanted to take the blessings of her land. She wanted to take the blessings of her memories and communicate them to her children and then her grandchildren. But more than that, much more than that, she had such confidence in the power of the word that she was sure that a word rightly planted can cross oceans and can cross centuries. And I was able to prove her right. Every day when her children were old enough to recite with her, they would say her old address, number 10, Knox Street, the flat over the shop, the village of Ballyhonis, County Mayo, God bless me, Ireland. And my father said every day he would have to repeat that at least once to her, number 10, Knox Street, the flat over the shop, the village of Ballyhonis, County Mayo, God bless me, Ireland. First she taught her children, then she taught her grandchildren, and my father taught me. I didn't have to recite it every day, but that powerful seed of a word was well planted. Because in the 1990s, while I was studying in London, I got on a plane and I flew to Ireland. And where did I go? Number 10, Knox Street to see the flat over the shop, the village of Ballyhonis, Canameo, God bless me, Ireland. The flat over the shop proved to be the flat over the pub, but that's to be expected, I suppose. The point is this. The word, when well planted, has such very great power that it can stay in the human memory for generations. It can capture the imagination and move people to action. I was able to get to Ireland by a means that my great-grandmother could not possibly have conceived of as a little girl. And I think of these things because we are now in the midst of the great cancel culture. The idea that there are some ideas, some words, some concepts, some forms of discourse, some narratives that cannot be tolerated, that cannot be admitted in polite company, and that must be canceled, must be removed from memory. I think such actions are violent. I think such actions are dangerous. And ultimately, I think that they're foolish. Why do I say that? Well, again, I spent most of my adult life as, a, as an academic. I submitted myself to the discipline of the word, learning to understand words, to speak words, to write words, to read words. And I brought that into the classroom. I brought that into the pulpit. I've brought that into my books and my articles and my broadcasting as well. I understand the power of the word. I come from a community that has a long legacy of missionary work, people getting onto boats, uh, going to the far end of the world, not ever expecting to go back, and fully recognizing that they would certainly die violently on the way or once they get there. And I have to ask myself, why did those missionaries take such very dramatic risks? It wasn't for their self-esteem. It wasn't for popular applause. It wasn't to be invited to sit at the cool kids' table. It's because the power of the word had seized their soul, their memory, their imagination, their will, and it formed their heart, it formed their thoughts, and it formed their actions. Let me ask you another question. Have you ever been canceled? And by that, I mean not 
dragged out and shot, not your your books burned in a pile as the tribunal decided that you've written counter-revolutionary thoughts. No, uh, pulled off of social media somehow. I had a very mild experience of that. Um, my books disappeared from a large venue uh, for 24 hours because apparently I appeared in some other venue that the book algorithms didn't approve of. And, and it was shocking to me. I, I felt that part of my soul had been sullied, uh, had been smothered, had been stifled. But I do believe that the word is triumphant because the word is the servant of the truth. Now, I know in our postmodern era, talking about truth with a capital T offends some people. There might be some eye rolling, there might be some coughing, there might be some nervous fidgeting. But I'm a, I'm a post-postmodernist. Modernism really happened, didn't work. Postmodernism was the response. Postmodernism really doesn't work either. So we're here at the level of the post-postmodern. There is no naive innocence that we can go back to, no great garden of discourse and philosophy where we can retain our original innocence on our own. But what we can do is recognize that giving up on the truth is a false modesty, and it produces nothing that is good. And one of the things I've learned from my great-grandmother, Catherine Caulfield, is that enduring power of the word, that power of the word that took my brother Jesuits and put them on missionary ships going to the far ends of the globe, knowing they would never go home, and knowing almost with certainty that they would die a violent death. I understand the power of the word when I preach or when I teach, and I see lights of recognition and understanding and knowing smiles in the congregation or among the students. I know the power of the word when I preach or when I teach or when I speak in spiritual direction, and I see tears of contrition, tears of joy, tears of healing. There is a false kind of silence that tries to stifle the word. There's a good, healthy, wholesome, monastic, contemplative silence that makes the receiving of the word easier. It's an indispensable kind of silence. But then there's the kind of silence that is a muffling, a strangulation of the word in the long run that cannot succeed because the truth is alive. The truth is dynamic. The truth is that for which the human soul and mind were made. And we're kidding ourselves if we think that the desire for the truth can really, truly be stifled. If you look into your own heart, if you look into your relationships, if you look at human history and the arts and literature, you'll see that deep down there is a desire to know the truth with a capital T. And it's my great privilege to be part of an intellectual and moral and spiritual tradition to say that truth with a capital T is identified with the good with a capital G. And the good with a capital G coincides with the beautiful, the capital B. The human soul is infinite. It cannot be contained by mere matter. It desires to know not just true things, desires to do not just good things, it desires to delight not just in beautiful things, but to encounter and embrace and imbibe and rest in truth itself, goodness itself, beauty itself. I think a moment's silence and reflection will allow you to see in your own mind and heart that this is true. So that raises a practical question for it, doesn't it? What are we to do? If you're listening to this, odds are you're like me. You take words seriously. You know words are powerful. Yes, words can hurt. Words can offend. Words can be a fire. Words can heal. They can build up. They can liberate. They can direct. They can shape souls and individuals and communities and cultures and even civilizations. I want to be one of the servants of that true and good and beautiful, the community of the word. And I think you do too, because you're listening to a thoughtful talk like this, but really ultimately because you're human. 
This is what we were all made for, to know the truth, to do the good, to delight in the beautiful. In this cancel culture that says, no, you can't say that. Stop thinking that. The right to be offended is the right, the right to not be offended trumps the rights of all others. Well, that's just nonsense. It's not meaningful. It doesn't help us to build a moral house in which we would want to live. And it's not anything that can really be lived anyway. So we have to choose, first of all, to love the word, to love its beauty, to love its goodness, to love its liberating, healing, revealing, confirming power. We have to learn to delight in its artistry. When I taught rhetoric, we began class reciting poetry. I said, you have to love how the words taste in your mouth. And you have to be able to enter into the story before you can lead people into the story yourself. Do that. If you've already been doing that, please make it a habit. Teach others to do the same. Share in the joy of sharing beautiful, powerful, hopeful words. And then form communities of resistance. Form parallel structures. Form communities that will pass on the word any way that it can. Even if it's just person to person, even if it's writing postcards and letters to friends and family, hand on the word. The word is the instrument of the true, the good, and the beautiful. And no government and no technology is greater than the truth. And however people may be oppressed, however people may be beaten down and silenced by powerful entities, the human soul persists. The great novelist and writer Alexander Solzhenitsyn, who certainly suffered for the beauty of the word, the goodness of the word, the truth of the word, he said, let the lie enter the world but not through me. It's not enough to know the truth and love the truth. We have to do the truth, we have to tell the truth, and we have to teach the truth. And we have to find lies to be abhorrent. However useful the lie might be, however safe the lie might lead us to think we can be, lies, in the end, lead us away to unreality. Lie annihilates existence. It injects the, it injects the cancer of non-entity into reality. A lie tears at the very fabric of resistance. So let's resolve to be truthful. Let's resolve to be truthful in a way that is good and beautiful. Let us choose to teach the truth to others and to do that with beauty and art and craft and joy. Let's refuse to silence others and let's refuse to be silenced ourselves. All those years ago, that little girl in Ireland, Catherine Caulfield, my great grandmother, understood in a very simple way the power of the word and she planted that seed in others. I am so glad that she did, and I ask you to do the same. Find the most true word, the most beautiful word, the most good word that you can find. Find patterns and strings of words that liberate and heal and illuminate and confirm. Commit them to memory. Know them, as the charming saying goes, by heart, and then teach them to others, generation after generation after generation. To be a servant of the word is the most humane and humanizing thing that we can do. And for those who have ears to hear, I will say even more. It is the most divinizing thing that we can do. I believe this as an academic, as a scholar, as a clergyman, as a religious, as someone who understands human nature and human history. Think on these things. Read about these things. Write about these things. And then most importantly, talk about them with others.